before. Okay, and you can you see my screen? We can. This is very exciting. See, it does work, just takes a little time. It's kind of like dealing with a virus, um, which is, of course, where we're starting today. Uh, these are certainly interesting times. Uh, in fact, one would go so far as to say they are, are truly unprecedented in modern economic history. Um, the question isn't the severity of the virus. We, we all appreciate that. Um, but the question is, is what's going to happen with the economy? What, what are the economic implications for what's going on around us today? Now, to be clear, it's interesting because at the start of this year, everybody was actually feeling better. It's interesting. 2019 was a fairly bearish year. Lots of conversations about various sorts of stressors on the economy. A lot of folks were predicting a recession. And in February of this year, how ironic was that date, uh, of course, the Wall Street Journal released their next next recession poll. And lo and behold, most of the economists who contributed to that poll have backed off their bearish predictions. And only 10% said we were going to have a recession in 2020. Now, of course, uh, we were also relatively positive about the economy. This was a slide I was using back in February. But even then, I noted that the biggest risk to the economy is, of course, this coronavirus. And it was a wild car. We sure what was going on. There was a lot of different kinds of information out there, but no one really knew where this whole thing was going. So it happened. Worst case scenario. And I won't go into the numbers. We don't have time for that. Besides, you see enough of it. We're well over a couple million cases, well over 100,000 cases across the globe. Uh, and to combat this virus, there's been uh, really a, almost across most nations who are dealing with this, there have been shelter in place rules. Uh, people are simply being asked, or in some cases being told, you have to stay home, you can't go to restaurants, you can't go to stores, you can't go to your work, you have to stay home. And of course, the big question that comes out of this is what does this mean for the economy? Well, if you've been reading the news, the answer is this is the end. I mean, everybody's talking about how it's, it's, we're already in a recession, and it's going to be a bad one. And you've heard all the bearish predictions. Uh, the IMF saying this is going to be the worst hit to the global economy since the Great Depression. Uh, the OECD tells us this is going to be felt for a long time to come. Financial markets are all over the place. Millions of people are applying for unemployment. You're talking about, in many cases, forecasts that suggest that this thing isn't going to get out of the system for two or maybe three years. Now, to be clear, no one really knows what's going to happen yet. Why? Because remember, forecasts rely on the past to help build a vision of the future. Well, we are in truly uncharted waters right now, not historically, but at least in the last 50 or 60 years, and thereby we don't have a lot of history to go with. So there's an old expression, a good forecaster is not smarter than everybody else. He merely organizes his ignorance in a little better way. And what I'm hoping to do today is kind of break this down, break down what's happening, put some thought and logic around it, and then see where that leads us in terms of implications for where the economy is going. Now, how negative are some of these outlooks? Here's a couple I just grabbed, and there's lots of these out there. This one of these on the left came from the Bank of America, on the right came from, comes from UBS. But wow, these are pretty dramatically negative numbers. Take, for example, the Bank of America forecast. They're talking about a massive decline in economic activity in the second quarter and a further reduction in the third. And they're talking about not getting back to Q4 19 levels of output until the end of 2021. That is a truly scary downturn. On the right-hand side is unemployment rates. And for UBS, they're talking about unemployment rates remaining at elevated levels through 2021 and only getting back to the current levels really at the end of 2022, a two and a half year labor cycle. These are scary numbers. And I kind of understand why everybody's getting a little bit freaked out. Really the only bit of data we have at this point in time are initial claims for unemployment. And those are truly startling. If you look at past recessions, the 75, early 80s, even the Great Recession, you can see that the insured unemployment rate got 
not ever all that high. Now, some of this has to do with who is and who isn't eligible for unemployment insurance. But as you can see, this time around, the numbers are, uh, are just off the charts. They're nothing like what we've seen in the past. And that is true in terms of the overall scale. But let's keep something else in mind. If you look at the past, one of the things you'll immediately note is that employment is a lagging indicator. Indeed, it's interesting to note that insured claims for unemployment peaked at the end of the Great Recession, not the beginning. And by the way, that's true for every past cycle. And that's because businesses only lay off people as a last case option. Laying off people and then afterwards having to hire people is an enormously expensive process. And businesses go out of their way to do everything but have to deal with that until they absolutely have to. And as such, employment lags the rest of the economy. It happens long after everything else does. But this time, while these numbers are truly startling, it doesn't fit at all the patterns of the past. It doesn't look anything like these past downturns. And that's very important. You cannot look at these initial claims and say, oh, this tells me exactly what it told me during the Great Recession. It does not. Now, to go to the next step, we also have to remember something else. I understand there's a lot of scary headlines out there, but then ask yourself, over the last decade, when haven't there been a lot of scary headlines? In fact, when it comes to economic conversations, I think we can kind of agree that hysteria is the new normal. I have to remind everybody that the same group of people screaming at us that this is going to be a depression-type economic cycle caused by this virus were largely the same people in January of last year, in 2019, who were explaining that the markets were down 20% because interest rates are rising, inflation was on the rise, the real estate markets were already crashing, and by the way, the trade war with China was going to demolish U.S. manufacturing. Of course, none of those things happened in 2019. And while this is by far and away the most severe negative shock to hit the U.S. economy in the last decade, I would simply point out that the degree of hysteria in the conversation has equivalently risen to new high levels of extreme hyperbolic predictions. You got to put this to one side and un shrieking headlines are just clickbait. They're just trying to get you to pay attention to them. Now let's take a little step back to understand the weirdness of where we are today and compare it to the past. Let's talk about what a recession is in the first place. Everybody has to remember that, recession, that, that growth is the default mode of any economy. No politician has ever created a growing economy and no politician has ever rescued an economy. Growth is the default mode. And that's because there is no the economy. Rather, there are millions of people who go out and they bust their butts on a day-to-day -day basis to do better for themselves, for their families, and their companies, period. Now, every once in a while, those people are prevented from doing what they want to do. The system doesn't work. Things fall in the equilibrium. And that's driven by a negative shock to the system. Now, to be clear, there are always negative shocks to the system. Some sectors rise, which cause other sectors to fall. Small things happen here. Negative shocks happen there. We're constantly beset by, by setbacks along the way. But for the most part, this big organic system called the economy can handle it. People adapt, things morph, people move jobs, and we continue to grow. But every once in a while, there is a shock that truly sets the system into turmoil and creates a negative feedback loop by which you cause a decline in aggregate demand, which causes people to be laid off, which means they spend less, which causes a bigger decrease in aggregate demand, and so on and so forth. And that shock and feedback effect creates enough disequilibrium that <coughs> the economy no longer grows. Instead, it actually contracts for a period of time before it starts to heal. Now, what kind of shock creates this sort of situation? Well, the answer is a shock to the system that has to have three characteristics. It's got to be very large, it's got to be very rapid, and it has to be sustained. And sustain is a critical issue here because it's the sustained part that causes businesses to finally lay off people. Now, this is the big question about where we are. Look, 
if you go back and say, this is going to be as bad as a great recession, then let's first talk about what created the great recession and see if that even smells the tiniest bit right. The great recession, by the way, was set off by, of course, what happened in the preceding six years. Six years in which between 2001 and 2007, there was $15 trillion of new consumer and financial sector debt. And this was all wrapped around, of course, the subprime revolution, a revolution that allowed people to borrow with zero underwriting, and somehow or other, Wall Street claimed they had a magic system to turn that into gold-plated securities. Turns out, it was one of the greatest frauds in history. Now, what happened in the meantime is what caused the Great Recession. While they were pumping all that money into the consumer sector, we saw huge imbalances start to form in housing and borrowing and consumers and, of course, consumer spending. Housing, because, of course, as money flowed into subprime mortgages, home production was vastly too high. We saw enormous amounts of borrowing, enormous amounts of, of, of price increases, and people took all that equity and, and borrowing to heart, and you saw savings rates drop to a very scare low level. In other words, in 2006, while growth might have felt good, it was clearly rotten to the core. Now, mind you, the Great Recession didn't happen overnight. It took a while for it to kick in. Everything really started to fall apart in late 06, early 07, and it took a full year for the collapsing housing market and subprime lending market to finally catch up with the rest of the economy and build up to a big enough shock to the system that everything started to fall apart. Now, it was nasty. Millions of jobs were lost in construction, finance, and, and retail sales lost permanently. Permanently because that subprime bubble collapsed and it wasn't coming back. And then there were a bunch of secondary job losses. It was a six quarter downturn where the economy contracted by almost 6% in real turn. And by the way, we didn't get back to normal levels of economic activity until 2015. It was one nasty cycle. It was a big deal. Now, how about today? Well, first of all, let's take a step back. There is no subprime bubble that's collapsing as far as we can tell. As far as I know, I don't see anything that seems as if we have hyperextended parts of the economy, such as housing and consumer spending. All anything we have right now is a bunch of job losses driven not by an economic shock to the system, but by public health mandates. Yes, a lot of people are not working right now, but to be perfectly clear, the reason they're not working is not because their businesses have gone bankrupt because there's no demand for their services, but because their clients are prevented from buying their services because of the public health mandates. That is an enormous deal. Look, we can all agree that if we came up with a cure for this virus tomorrow, everybody would almost assuredly go back to the work the day after that. In other words, these aren't permanent job losses. The way the job losses running up and into the Great Recession were truly permanent. There is no reason to anticipate a major structure in the structure of the economy. There just isn't. Now, it isn't to say this is harmless. Of course, there's harm being created here. But the kind of harm being created is a harm that's driven right now as the economy is shut down. People aren't earning money. Businesses aren't earning profits. And obviously, the longer that goes, the more true long-run harm builds up in the system. But we don't know how much harm is actually going to occur. We don't. And for anybody to sit out there and say they know how this is going to shake out and this is going to be tremendously bad when candidly we're completely operating in the dark, well, I find that to be something between, well, either completely intellectually dishonest or mm, candidly uh, simply dis disingenuous. Now, we don't know where this is going, but there are plenty of potential scenarios. And you could argue it could be, as everybody's saying, a big nasty shock. And the thing about this, let's just kind of run through this. We know, of course, the economy's been growing fine. At some point in the future, it will grow fine again. What's going to happen between now and then after this large negative shock driven by these public health mandates? Well, one, of course, outlook is the Great Recession, where the harm to the system stays in the system, and we have this long, slow, painful recovery, a grace of recession type scenario. Another argument would be, actually, this is pretty short and quick. It's a downtick. And then we immediately bounce back up again, right? I mean, why would it be such a long downturn? Where's the major reorganization of the economy? 
And then, by the way, there's even a third scenario that people aren't even talking about at all. That's a natural disaster type scenario. Look, if you think about, say, when Miami-Dade slammed into, into I'm sorry, when Miami-Dade was ha hammered by Hurricane Andrew back in the day, you're talking about a major wipeout of a major metropolitan economy. But guess what? They weren't down and out for years. They had a really nasty down quarter because for two months they were cleaning and fixing and trying to get their, their basic infrastructure of their city back up and running. But you know what? The quarter after that, everybody went crazy and everybody went out and partied and the tourists came back and you saw a surge in economic activity before you got back to normal levels of output. Is it going to be a great recession, a mild recession, or perhaps just a big bounce? We don't know. And that's the critical issue. Everybody's assuming the worst case. I don't think they're right. Why? Because the way to think about this is to ask four basic questions. A, how long, how deep is the shutdown? We don't have that information, but we have some guiding principles. Two, how healthy was the economy prior to the pandemic? Is this simply setting off a cascade event within the midst of a historically weak economy? Or is this a strong economy that's well-balanced thus can deal with the hit. Number three, what is the government doing in the meantime? Fiscal policy matters, people, and you gotta bring that in to think about the predictions. And last but not least, long run effects. Are there true issues with how consumers are going to come back if they come back at all? Well, let's go through these step by step. First of all, let's talk about the how deep. Now, a lot of folks are giving you a lot of scary numbers, but again, we don't have much in the way of information. We only have data on retail sales and industrial production for, Q, for March, just in the last few days. And then those numbers, by the way, don't look all that bad. Retail sales, by the way, in the first quarter of this year are only off about 2.3%. About that's not a very big number when you think about it. And that's, of course, because this really only happened in the second half of March. Industrial production also fell a little bit. But again, the numbers aren't all that scary. Indeed, when you look at Q1, it doesn't seem like it's going to be very negative at all. And about a 0% would seem logical. And indeed, if you take a look at the Atlanta Fed numbers, you got to remember, the shock hit the system at the, at the back end of Q1. And while everybody's talking about a, a negative 4, negative 5, negative 6% first quarter, I don't know how that happens when 75, 80% of the Q1 was already in place when we actually started shutting everything down. Now, the current numbers through the end of last month suggest about 0%. That's plus or minus a half percent. There's a couple big numbers out there on trade and inventories we all have to look at before we can really come up with anything. But it probably isn't going to be all that bad of a quarter. Now, the second quarter, on the other hand, no doubt that's going to be gory. Um, probably be the worst quarter ever because, of course, mandates are simply not allowing certain parts of our economy to operate. They're just not. Now, what kind of numbers are we talking about? Again, no one really knows because we don't have a lot of ways of scaling this, but I think a good steady number would be about negative 30%. Now that scares like a, that sounds like a really scary number, but remember economists have this annoying habit of actually presenting everything in annualized form. What that really means is about a 7.5% decline in economic output this set of quarter of the year. Still historically bad, but not that bad. You're still talking about the vast majority of the economy still operating and moving forward. So take a deep breath. The whole world hasn't come to an end, despite the fact that sometimes it feels like it when you're listening to the news. But the real question is, how long is this going to go for, right? Because we get it, how deep it is. How long? Well, yet again, we do have some information on this because public health data is coming out a lot faster than economic data. For example, if you look at China right now, China, of course, which is almost three months into this, and they've really gotten over the number of new cases. Italy's over the hump, Spain's over the hump. In fact, most of Europe is over the hump at this point in time. And yes, even the, United, even the United States is starting to get there as well. Now, what about economic activity wrapped around this? Well, again, we don't have a lot of information, but because China's ahead of the game, that's the best place to look. And this is the data that came from Goldman Sachs. Um, they have some high uh, frequency data on China, but man, I would love to get my hands on. But I don't have Goldman Sachs bob, bob, pockets. Uh, but I, I do get their PDFs. I'm fortunate to do that, so I will present this data. And on the left, you can see their industrial activity tracker. This is day-to-day -day stuff based on trucks and coal consumption stuff. And by the way, 
they're actually back to where they were. So about three months for the industrial part of the economy to get back up and running. Uh, on the other side, <coughs> consumer spending. A little bit of a longer slog, but they are getting back to normal slowly but surely. If you did a basic linear trend, you're talking about a little over four months to get back to normal. In other words, okay, three to four months. Now, yet again, when you think about the United States, we have also peaked. All the data suggests that we are, of course, on the other side of this. Things are starting to subside. And if we ride that, that kind of curve down, and you think about the numbers coming out of China, three to four months, what you're really talking about here is Q3 more or less being when we reopen. Next, this, this quarter, we'll probably see some partial reopenings with a limitations here and there, which will help mitigate some of the hits we're hitting, feeling right now. But again, all the numbers suggest everything should more or less get back to normal levels of activity once we get into the third quarter of this year, but for any kind of damage that may occur in the meantime. So it doesn't seem like this thing's gonna go on a long time. Now, there are some, of course, issues here. For example, we do have to worry about the idea of some sort of second resurgence. We'll just have to play that by air at this point in time. How healthy was the economy at the beginning of this? Well, yet again, all the data says we were not a fragile economy. Now again, that's not the headline. Every headline says this is an insanely fragile economy. It's like a piece of delicate crystal. Any little tap will cause it to fall apart. And actually, no. This economy has been kind of moving forward in a steady, strong, not the fastest, most exciting, but nevertheless, stubbornly persistent pace. We've had taken shocks before, whether it was the Chinese trade war or the massive commodity bust that occurred back in 14 and 15. And we kind of weathered it without any sort of problem at all. We are a fundamentally healthy economy. Savings rates, for example, for households. Those, by the way, are back up to 8%. That's the last time they've been at this level sustained was back in the early 1990s. Very good numbers here. On the right-hand side, wage gains for Americans. This is uh, from the Atlanta Fed wage tracker, which is, by the way, good data, unlike the stuff that comes out of the BLS monthly, which is no good. And the economist who cites the wage numbers from the monthly labor report should lose their economist license if there is such a thing. But the real data actually suggests that average wage growth has been 4%, median 2% in real terms. Uh, financial obligations ratio, the percent of household income used on debt and various sorts of obligations, that's near a record low level right now because of slow pace of debt accumulation and of course lower interest rates. Well, that may be true for the top 1%. Actually, it's true for everybody. On the left-hand side is ratio of debt payments to family income for different levels of income within the U.S. economy. This comes from the best data we have, the Survey of Consumer Finances from the Federal Reserve. And it doesn't paint anything like a financially fragile consumer sector for every level of the economy. Not only are median payments down in every income category, down from where they were in 07, they're lower than they were back in 1998. Again, this is not a financially delicate consumer sector. As for job growth, it has been slowing, but that's only because the unemployment rate's been at 3.5%, a 50-year low level. And while some businesses may not come out of this, let's remember that those, that those workers who are let go are going to be re-entering a labor market that for two years has been suffering from labor shortages. Now, again, you don't hear that in the headlines, but that's what we've been dealing with, labor shortage issues across the United States. Right now, that, well, at least according to the most recent data, the number of job openings in the United States has been greater than the number of people looking for work, greater than. And by the way, that's been true for over two years running. This is a solid economy. How about real estate? Well, again, a very similar sort of picture. I, I heard Moody's come out with some forecast suggesting you could see 15% of homeowners go belly up as bad as through the Great Recession. That's just not reasonable. Right off the bat, even if you thought this was gonna be as bad as the Great Recession, it's not gonna have that kind of impact on the housing markets. The impact in the housing markets back then didn't come from the shock from the Great Recession. Housing wasn't a byproduct of the Great Recession. Housing drove the Great Recession because it was so inflated in the first place. This time around, our housing markets are vastly more healthy than they were back then. 
There is no excess supply of units. For 10 years, as opposed to being in the midst of a subprime borrowing glut, instead, Dodd-Frank because it was really limited borrowing to really some of the best credit-worthy households. Over the last decade, median credit scores for mortgage borrowing has been above 750. Today, the equity share in the real estate market is near an all-time high level. And by the way, this isn't driven by massive price increases. This is driven by simply a slow pace of mortgage borrowing. The cost of borrowing. You know, we keep hearing how expensive housing is. Actually, according to the American Community Survey, housing is the cheapest it's been in the last decade, both for renters and owners, once you look at housing costs as a percent of income. The share of those who are non-housing costs constrained going up, those who are housing costs constrained going down, and that trend's been consistent again for 10 years. Not a fragile housing market. As for the financial sector overall, again, the screams of dismay and decline coming out of the hedge fund industry would be almost humorous if people weren't taking them so seriously. Look, no, we don't have a major debt problem in the United States. Private sector debt's been falling, again, for any number of years. Consumer debt's down. Financial sector down, says the debt is down. The only place you've seen a debt continue to grow as a percent of GDP is for non-financial corporate business, which, by the way, isn't even a lot of the debt out there. But hey, someone's got to make something about something, so they're going to keep keying on that and telling us how bad that's going to be. Well, actually, it's not that bad. Because while it is true, non-financial corporate debt is high, so is non-financial corporate profits. And oh, by the way, once you consider low interest rates, it turns out the debt obligations for the, for the non-financial corporate sector are actually very, very good. No major problems there. No major problems at all. And of course, remember, the delinquencies that started creeping into the financial system that eventually led to the, the massive meltdown in financial markets those delinquencies back then started in 2006, a year before the recession hit. It takes a long time for these things to work their way through the credit markets. Right now, we don't have any problems in the credit markets. In fact, if you look at bank delinquencies for any variety of loans, they're an all-time record low level for, co for commercial real estate, regular real estate, consumer loans. This is a pretty solid financial market. Now, what about government policy? Again, holy cow. When you think about the Great Recession, for the first half of 2008, people were arguing even if we had, were in a recession. Turns out we were. And of course, by the time we started thinking about what to do about it, that didn't happen until the end of 08. And in fact, we didn't get any substantial policies in the place in the early 09. They started a year late, and even then, the efforts they made weren't all that good. This time around, well, aren't we fortunate that we're aware of the shock to the system before an election. Because when there's election coming up, everybody opens up the spending, <laughs> the spending faucet like nobody's business. And this is truly astonishing. You know, we live in a $22 trillion economy, which means every quarter, there's about five and a half trillion dollars worth of economic transactions going on. Five and a half trillion. Now, we, currently have a two and a half trillion dollar stimulus plan. Two and a half trillion dollar spending plan in a quarter where you have five and a half trillion dollars worth of ec economic activity. Wow. I mean, that's crazy. That's a huge number. Hey, you can't just, you can't just ignore that. And of course, you, you know all this about payments to households, payments to workers, payments to businesses, payments to small business, local government support. It's not just the federal government. The Fed's getting into play. Rate cuts, few, a few, a few full-out quantitative easing effort. Local other institutions, the IRS, you don't have to pay your taxes. States, you don't have to pay your taxes. There's no evictions going on right now. Large landlords are simply giving rent deferrals to everybody up front. Large public mortgage lenders allowing owners to defer mortgages. Food programs are expanding. Have we ever seen this kind of massive intervention in such a short run? Never. So again, this goes a long way towards keeping things from getting out of hand while we're being shut down. So when you add it up, go through that with the list. How long? How deep? Well, it's not that deep. Maybe seven and a half, eight percent of the economy. How long? We'll be out of this by the third quarter. How good was the economy? Pretty darn good. 
What is the government doing? Everything. Why would this be a bad downturn? There's no reason, absolutely no reason whatsoever. Just it's not. So why are the stock markets going crazy? Well, for the same reason they went crazy a year and a half ago. Again, 20% declines in Q1 of 2019. By the way, that was the sixth major soft in the stock market since the Great Recession came to an end. This is now the seventh. Remember, hysteria is the new normal. And that is a real problem. You know, we need to take one lesson away from this. You know, in the past, when the stock markets have been freaking out, when the, when the financial markets have been freaking out, I kind of laugh at it because I know everything's okay. This time, they freaked out to the point where they actually threatened to create a crisis in their own right. No virus, had the financial markets been allowed to melt down the way they were, we would have created one really out of thin air. Folks, the financial system is supposed to be the shock absorber of the U.S. economy. When bad things happen, they're supposed to be our protection, our bulletproof armor. They haven't turned into that. Quite the opposite. Our financial markets are now shock accelerators. They're making things worse, not better. And that's because the markets have become unhinged. It's becoming a vast gambling game where, candidly, GQ Public is the mark at the table with all the professional gamblers. I hope at some point in time, regulators wake up to what's going on. This volatility is not normal, it's not healthy, it's not sustainable, and they need to get into why the system is so badly broken and stop this from happening to yet again turn in our financial markets to what they were supposed to be, our protection. So, wrapping it all up, it's not that bad. Back then, millions of jobs lost permanently. Right now, people losing their jobs for two months, maybe two and a half months. Back then, people had no idea what they were gonna do next. But right now, the vast majority of these laid off people know exactly what they're gonna do next. In six weeks, they're gonna be working at the job they worked at six weeks ago. It's not the same thing. Back then, the financial system was pushed to the edge of, of insolvency because of the massive quantity of bad debt that built up in the system. This time around, there is no mountain of bad debt out there to screw up the system. It's just not the same thing. Now again, there's no doubt there's gonna be a little bit of pain out there, and this isn't gonna go away completely quietly. But with massive government intervention, the idea that this thing is gonna turn into a great recession type situation, it makes no sense whatsoever. So a couple basic thoughts here. First of all, don't be penny wise and palm foolish. Yes, maybe they overdid it with the public health warnings. Maybe the stay in place stuff were, was a little over dramatic, but you know what, it worked. It wasn't about flattening the curve, people. It was about getting rid of the curve. Had you let this thing get out of hand, if we had another massive second round, it would have been really ugly and a lot of people would have died. The cure is not worse than the disease here, not with everything else that's going on. Second thing to think about is yet again, that government stimulus. Look, I'm glad they're getting into the mix, but let's all take a step back and also recognize there is still cost benefit analysis. Hey, Congress, give us everything. It's free money. It's not free money. This is borrowing. And to put this in context, we already had a fiscal crisis on our hand. A long run one, because we all know that somewhere around 2030 to 2032, we're gonna have a fiscal crisis because Medicare and Social Security is gonna crash the federal government. Oh, by the way, we have a short run fiscal crisis too, because despite the fact that we're in the 10th year of a, of 11th year of a major economic expansion and one of the most fundamentally healthy economies we've ever seen, our government was still gonna borrow a trillion dollars this year. Oh yeah, now they're gonna trillion, uh, borrow two and a half trillion more. Three and a half trillion dollars of borrowing in one fiscal year as a percent of GDP, largest ever. Larger than during the Great Recession. Larger, believe it or not, than during World War II when we were fighting a major global war. Wow. You know, this is scary stuff, folks. And it's only a matter of time before this comes back to haunt us. So let's pay attention to that too. So what's my outlook. Where are we at? Well, Q1, 0%, plus or minus 2%. Q2, 
30% negative, plus or minus 10%. Big, nasty number, worst we ever saw. Q3, however, 25% up. A almost complete bounce back. Not complete, there be, will be some residual damage, but pretty much complete. And by the way, that'll be the best source, best quarter for growth we've ever seen. Now, by the way, is that a recession? You know, some people call a recession two quarters of negative growth. We may not have that. Other folks say, well, it's a protracted period of economic disturbance. Yet again, is three months protracted? Hard to say. It's an academic debate. Clearly, it's a big deal. But I don't know. Doesn't seem to be anything like the Great Recession. Yes, there's going to be some moderate upticks in death distress. Stock markets all over the map. But I don't see any major reason to think this is going to have any impact on long-run investments, whether we're talking housing or commercial real estate or, or venture capital and, and various sorts of investments like that. Again, why would it? Look, this thing is here and it's going to be gone. The long run is much different than the short run. Now, there's a lot of wild cards here. It could be a second round of outbreaks. Viruses are they're, they're, they're uncanny things. They mutate. They change. They shift. We've got to pay attention to it. Now, again, as much as I know that we'll come back at some level, I can also tell you this. Remember, a little return to the virus is not that big of a deal because now we get it. Now we have testing. Now we understand what's going on. They got, they got the surprise attack once. We sat around obliviously through February when this thing was creeping into our system. This time around, it's not going to happen. We'll see. Number two, yes, there's going to be some pain coming out of industries primarily that were already distressed in the first place. Some retail, some restaurants are not going to reopen, not because the virus killed them, but rather to hasten the death that was already in play. These sectors are under stress. There's too many restaurants and retail is getting hammered by the internet. This is just pushing forward some way with the closures that were already going to have to happen. Can the financial crisis create its own crisis? I don't think so. But man, I hope we pay attention to make sure this doesn't happen again. And last but not least, will consumers go back to normal behavior? Now this one's complete speculation, right? Because we don't really know. But one of the things yet again that makes me a little crazy, and if you could tell, a lot of things make me a little crazy. Um, this is not a new normal. It's not. Oh, it's a new normal. No, it's not a new normal. It's a new normal for our generation because we've been fortunate to live the last 40 to 45 years in a largely pandemic-free world because of modern medicine. But no longer. We've learned the hard way that turns out it's not completely pandemic-free. We still have to be a little bit cognizant of things. Now, by the way, prior to 40 years ago, epide epidemics, pandemics happened all the time. Nothing new about that. Nothing new at all. And, you know, when you think about that, more than 50 years ago, 60 years, 70 years ago, when it was polio or the Spanish flu or measles or the mumps, when these things happened, or smallpox, when these things happened, did people stop going out? Did they stop congregating? Did they stop being social? No. They dealt with it. And then when the pandemic was gone, they went back to business. And you know what? I'd like to think we're as tough as they were. I really would. I don't think this is going to have a dramatic impact on us. I do think we'll get back to normal. We may wash our hands a little bit more and shake hands a little less. So be it. It's not going to hurt the economy. So if you couldn't tell, I'm largely positive on things. I don't think it's all that bad. I think we're going to bounce back quick. And I think the preposterous, hyperbolic, hysteric, negative outlooks, well, are just that. Don't let it get in your head. Think about this logically, and you start to realize this may be a nice lesson for us. Because this, this thing had truly been as dangerous as Ebola, as dangerous as SARS or MERS. This could have been much, much uglier than it is. Let's learn the lesson. Let's get through this, get this thing under control, and move on. Now, last thing. A forecaster is an expert. You'll know tomorrow why the things you predicted yesterday didn't happen today. We'll see. I appreciate the uncertainty out there, but I think there's a good case to be made for a very strong V. And all those folks out there saying this is going to be a U for sure, well, I'm pretty sure you're wrong. And I think, I know you're being highly, highly irresponsible 
by giving people only the gloomiest potential outcome of the current situation we're in. Thank you very much.